Okay, we are going to be in Colossians chapter 3. We're actually going to be in three places, so you need three bookmarks. You will have to turn to each one of these places. It won't, you can't just listen. Um, well, you can, but you shouldn't. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, it's the first place. Uh, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 6, Colossians 3. All right, now before we get started, just one word to those of you who are who don't have kids or maybe who've, who've had kids who move on. Um, you may not have kids in your family right now, but the fact is if you are par- a part of the member, if you're a member of the body of Christ, that means you have lots of kids. All the kids running around, they're yours, okay? So even if you don't have a parent or if you don't have a kid at home, you are in Christ's parents. So the stuff that we talk about today is going to be good for you. You're going to want to listen to it and apply it, um, as well as there's another reason, even if um, you can't get into that, which you should be able to, but even if you can't get into that, every bit of God's word we've said over and over again tells us something about him, right? So you're reading Leviticus, you're reading Numbers, you're reading about the, uh, uh, the, the God's will for Near Eastern peasants in um, the ancient world. It's good for you because then you getting to see what God's will is helps you see a little bit about God's character and nature. So pay attention, listen up, all right? It's a, this is going to be great. You're going to love it. Um, all right, well, um, let's go ahead and get started. During um, our last year in seminary, Anne and I took a class called The Theology of Children. Now, it wasn't talking about children who do theology, but it was talking about thinking about children in a theological way. It was a great class. Anne and I were in our 20s, so we didn't think we, you know, didn't think much about children, and um, we didn't know if we were going to have any. Anne wanted some, I didn't, but now I guess it's a good thing we took the class. It was a good class. Um, we, he gave us some really good uh, information about children and about just some practical hands-on stuff until about mid-semester when the topic of discipline came up, discipline in a Sunday school classroom and discipline at, at home. And um, I remember the class well, and as too, we talk about it all the time. Uh, and I'll just, I'll give you what I remember of what was said. I'm not going to say this is a direct quote, but let me just tell you what the professor said, the, the gist of it. A child must be permitted to explore freely, to touch, taste, feel, whatever he or she wants, which means parents and teachers are responsible for child-proofing the environment. And if the child is going to become creative, curious, self-confident, unhindered by self-doubt, then parents and teachers ought never to use the word no. No is the child's word to you. No is never the parent's word to the child. He or she must learn to set her own limits and see the world as an open place where there are no roadblocks to learning um, and exploring. I don't remember uh, the which theory of, of child development that this, that my professor at the time, was a very nice lady, um, I don't remember which theory of child development this woman embraced, but uh, my mom tried a very similar theory when I was young, um, for about a week, I think, uh, it was, it was, uh, uh, you guys know who Dr. Spock is, not the St- Spock on Star Trek, but he was a, a, a psychologist or a child psychologist, and he emphasized positive reinforcement instead of negative reinforcement. So if you did, if I did something bad, the idea was my mom wouldn't say, no, don't do that. She would just ignore me. But then when I did something good, she would praise me to the skies. And the idea is that over time I would want to seek her praise, so I would do good things and not bad things. Um, my mom tried that again for about a week. Um, at the end of which I got a very serious spanking, she tells me. So it didn't quite work out um, for her um, and didn't quite work out for me. Uh, There are thousands of child development theories out there, and some are helpful. We get some good, good advice from some of them. But there are two foundational truths that secular theories about children 
And human beings in general actually reject or ignore. And in the end, because these two truths are rejected or ignored, most secular theories were, are going to prove incompatible with the biblical model. Now, both truths are not unique to children, but to, they apply to all human beings. Now, this uh, first, I, I, I hate to say this, this first sermon in our discussion of child-parent relationships is uh, going to be dealing with kind of a, a um, some theory here and some theology, so you're going to have to stay with me in your thinking, okay? Don't drift off. Don't be thinking about the barbecue or whatever is happening after this. Just, just stick with me, okay? And then um, uh, next week will be much more practical and hands-on, but let's, let's, just, let's just go and talk about these two truths. The first truth is that human beings are fallen, right? Now, we know that. If you've been here for a while, you know that. Um, well, what does that mean? Let's go ahead and turn. I, I told you to mark Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. Let's go ahead and turn there. And we read this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now that last clause there, uh, the, well actually the second to the last clause, and we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, that's huge for our purposes. So, so Paul here doesn't say, you know, hey, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. He says we are by nature children of wrath. That means we do what provokes God's wrath, that's sin, disobedience, self-focus, idolatry, pride, you name it, without trying. We don't have to make an effort to do those things. Those things just come right naturally to us. We don't have to try that. It's who we are. Our hearts and our minds are from conception, by nature, oriented selfward rather than Godward. So as soon as you're old enough to know the difference between what God wants you to do and what other things out there that you could do, you choose, you tend to choose not to do what God would have you do. That's just, that's just your nature, that's who you are, and that's who I am. Now we know, we, you, if you were listening during the first reading, Genesis 1, that's not how you were created, that's not how human beings were originally created or designed, but that's what's happened since sin entered the world. That's where we are now. We don't, then, learn to sin. Um, we come prepackaged, sin-ready, batteries included. It's all there. Um, if you have kids... You know this. This is not a mystery to you. You don't have to teach your kids, for example, to say mine, right? I remember with Muriel, we were trying to get her to say mommy or daddy, and the, one of the first words she said before either of those two was mine. She got that because she has other brothers and sisters. She knew that. We don't have to teach our kids how to lie. They're very good at that. We don't teach, have to teach them how to be cruel toward each other. They know that. They've got it down pat. None of that stuff has to be taught. It doesn't even really have to be learned from their environment. They just kind of come out, and there they are, right? Um, that's, that's just the way they are. They're equipped. And so maybe if, if we realize that, you can see the problem with purely secular parenting methods. And by secular, I mean what you hear in, in the world. Um, the world assumes that children are by nature good, so you just get out of the way and let their na nature flourish, and everything will be great, right? That's kind of the assumption in the world. But if by nature we are children of wrath, getting out of the way is standing aside as our children lurch happily down the broad path that leads to destruction. Right? So that's the first truth. 
Now, the second truth that secular theories ignore or reject is a positive one. It's a good one. All human beings are designed and made to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what Adam and Eve were doing in the garden when they were created. They were enjoying God. And everything they did in the garden before sin came in the world was glorifying him because they were his creatures doing what he created them to do. That's how we were originally created. And that's really at the core of who we are as people created in God's image. We were created to glorify God and enjoy him, enjoy him forever. Now those two things, joy and glorifying God, go together. Like we sometimes don't see that. John Piper says, and it's true, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. And we are most satisfied when we turn from self to God. Our souls and our bodies were made for fellowship with him. And so no passing, dying, earthly pleasure or good will satisfy. That's what we do, right? I mean, we think that we, we come equipped with this desire for joy and this desire for happiness. And so we cram our souls full of alcohol and drugs or whatever it is we think is going to give us that thing. And it doesn't. And then we wind up miserable and miserable and miserable. And it just goes on for the rest of our lives, trying to cram that stuff into our souls and bodies. So the first truth that we're fallen means that we get really confused about the second truth that we were designed and created to enjoy God and glorify Him. Our natural desire to be happy is misdirected so that we look for ultimate happiness in fleeting worldly stuff that dies rather than in God. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ and you're wondering why your life isn't what you want it to be and you are looking for something in this world that will fulfill you and satisfy you, drop whatever it is you're looking for. Jesus Christ is it. He is it. Surrender everything else and seek him, and you will find what you're looking for, I promise you. Better yet, he promises you. All right, so kids are born then, um, fallen, self-oriented, but because of who they were created to be, there remains this deep, Deep longing for satisfaction and love, which means they're very, very open to knowing and loving Jesus. Right? So there's some truth. I said a minute ago that we're all fallen, but there is some truth to that idea that children are innocent. They, you know, we've spent, at least I have, or I guess we all kind of have in some way probably, we spent a good 20, 30 years of our lives taking our basic fallen nature and making it harder and, and, and more and more conflicted by following desires away from God. So we're hardened in our addictions. We're hardened in our hatreds. We're hardened in our unforgiveness. We're hardened in the things that we love to do that take us away from God. Kids haven't done that stuff yet. They haven't had the opportunity to get misdirected yet. They aren't hardened by habit and hurt and crushing failure and rejection. They want love and joy. Only God can satisfy that. So your task, and I don't just mean parents, I mean your task and my task, is to show them that only God can satisfy. To show them that truth before they get crushed, before they get hardened. Okay, do you see now, just for an aside, a friendly aside, do you see now why it's more important that your kid is in Sunday school than a soccer game or practice? I mean, I wonder what happened. Uh, this is totally a decide. It's not my text. I wonder what happened if all Christians just pulled their kids out of any sport that interfered with church. I see we'd see some coaches changing their practice schedule and their game schedules is what we'd see. Okay, anyway, that was, again, not in my text. But um, because, these, because kids are open to God, right? Because they want to know what will bring them joy and pleasure 
in life. This is why God tells and commands parents um, to raise children from infancy, to know him and to love him. There's no, like, there's no sense in Scripture that God says, oh, you know what, why don't you just tell them a little bit about this faith and a little bit about this faith and a little bit about this path and let them choose for themselves when they get older. No, because they're already prone to idolatry. So don't give them ammunition. Point them to Jesus from the beginning. And keep pointing them to Jesus. All right, so the instruction God gives both children and parents is built on these two truths that were fallen and that we were made to glorify and enjoy God. Um, and we'll see that as we look down at our text. We'll be in, now I want you to hold open both Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 6. So you can do that by just holding them between your fingers like that. And um, I want to show you some things. Ephesians chapter 6. Well, actually, uh, if you have them between your finger, we'll start in Colossians 3, 20 through 21. I'll just reread it. It's very short. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Uh, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. You see that? Everyone read that? Now, hold the page there. Flip over to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents. In the Lord, wow, same command, you see that? Um, for this is right, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Okay, so both these commands, the commands to the, fa to the parents, and the fathers in particular, and to the children, are built on those two truths that we talked about. Children are born oriented away from God and towards sin, so God says to them, obey your parents. Listen to your parents. Don't be stupid, right? Um, and uh, they're made to glorify God and enjoy him forever, so God commands parents, fathers in particular, raise your children in the instruction and the knowledge of the Lord. The of the Lord. Don't frustrate them. Make God something they want to seek. Children have one call, obedience. Parents have one call, teach your children to know, love, trust, and serve Jesus. Okay, now let's start by looking more carefully. Start. <laughs> You've been going for 16 minutes and I say start. That's got to scare you out there. But um, let's, uh, we're, we're halfway through, I promise. Let's look first uh, more carefully at what God says to children. Next week we're going to be looking very carefully at what uh, God says to parents. Um, the word for children in both texts is techna, which refers to any child of whatever age who remains dependent upon parents. Okay, so this is how it might apply to some of you 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds, right? You can be two, year old, two years old or you can be 40 years old and you can still be a techna according to this command. If you're still depending on your parents for shelter or for money or for anything, you're a techna and this command applies to you. All right, let's look and see what he says. Why do you think, I kind of answered it already, but I'll help you maybe put some flesh on this. Why does God command children to obey? Now, a few Sundays ago, this was probably, I think it was two Sundays ago, actually, um, it was like 5 p.m. on Sunday. We both, or I get up at 4 a.m. I get up, I do that most every day, but which is ridiculous. But I get up at 4 a.m. and I work on my sermon, and then um, I do the final edits and stuff. And then we go to church, and then at the time, at the end of church, like at two, I'm exhausted, and I want to go home and collapse. And so is Anne. And so we sit there on the couch and we kind of stare at each other and say really inane things um, that don't make any sense because we're both exhausted. Um, so there we were two Sundays ago, sitting down there, talking with each other in this zone, and Muriel walks into the room, and we don't notice, but she happens to have a pair of scissors, not like the kid scissors, but the adult scissors in her hands, and she's walking around, and she gets up, we have this, if you've been in our living room, you know we have this wooden, uh, uh, what do you call it, rocking chair um, for kids. She gets up on the rocking chair, and she holds on to the back of the rocking chair with one hand, and with the other hand she has the scissors, she's going like this, back and forth. Right? And so we don't, you know, see, she gets on there and she stand, oh, this is, we're bad parents, but we'd rather sometimes stand up there um, and we don't, we, we don't tell her to get off all the time. But, um, so we were just continue to talk. And then we looked over and we noticed the, the scissors in her hands 
and we freaked out. No, Muriel, no. We got up and, and, and we, we took the, the scissors um, out of, of her hands and we were, we were, very, um, we were very much afraid. Um, now, Anne and I, and hopefully you, understand that when you can barely walk, holding sharp scissors and standing on a rocking chair is stupid. Right? You get that, right? I get that. Muriel can't see that. She's enjoying herself. She's having a great time. She's always wanted those scissors. That's childhood. That's the teenage years. That's your life until you get out on your own and experience the, the necessity of making your own way and being responsible. You don't believe me? Well, listen to this. So one Friday when I was 16 or 17, I can't remember exactly how old I was, my friends and I decided um, to head down to Mexico and buy beer for a party that night. You can buy it without having to be 21 down in Mexico, and we were only two hours away where I grew up from Mexico, so we'd always drive down there on the weekends, get our booze, and then come back up for the party in the weekend. That's what we did. Um, well, this um, particular night, um, we decided before heading down, you know, why don't we get the party started now? So we had some beer left over from last weekend, and we thought to ourselves, why don't we go pick that up and start drinking on the way down? Now, it just happened to be also homecoming weekend. Um, now, I don't know what the, the tradition is here, but in Corpus Christi, Texas, the tradition was you would get white shoe polish and just paint all over people's windows, make all sorts of funny messages on their cars and that sort of thing. So, okay, now picture this image, if you will. Three 16, 17-year-old boys in a car painted with shoe polish, drinking on the way to Mexico, right? And guess what? I kid you not. I was surprised to see flashing lights behind me. I was surprised. How did they? Why are they pulling us over? I'm going the speed limit. I was surprised. That's because I was stupid. <laughs> I was foolish. All techna are. That's, what the, that's how the Bible describes us if we're techna. Um, that's why techna, our children, are called by God to obey. And that's why, incidentally, we'll get to this more next week, parents are called to make sure you do that. The danger is this. You don't know yourself or the world, but you think you do. You're a mixture of arrogance and stupid. And I say that with all love. I love you, but you're, you, that's just who you are, and that's who I was, and that's who everybody sitting in here who's gone through growing up has been. If you're still under your parents' roof, you may think your parents' rules are unreasonable because they don't know your world. They're operating on the basis of the way things used to be way back in the olden days with the covered wagons and all that stuff. <laughs> they dress badly, they listen to horrible music, and they have no idea what it's like to be you. And you may be partly right. But your first problem is that what you don't know about the world and about yourself eclipses their uncoolness. It really does. Your ignorance is like this huge, gigantic shadow of ignorance, and their uncoolness is just like this little small bit of uncoolness because to their friends they went to high school with, they're still pretty cool. Your second problem is that the main person who sees that truth is God, who knows you and who knows your parents perfectly, and he says... Obey your parents. They're wiser than you are. You can't, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're living with your parents, if you're in your parents' house, you cannot follow Jesus and at the same time live like this in a consistently disobedient way toward your parents. You can't. To follow Jesus as a child means obeying your parents. 
what it means. Now, the command comes with a promise that you'll live long in the land. You see that in Ephesians uh, uh, 6, I think, 4. You'll live long in the land and be blessed. Now, that's not like a magic promise so that if you clean up your room, God's going to drop a Porsche out of the sky and then you know, you're going to live to be 100. That's not like a magic promise. That's a very practical promise, right? That what that means is, um, is that if you consistently ignore your parents, you'll probably wind up dead, drunk, divorced, or in jail. But if you listen to them, you'll not make as many life-shortening decisions. And you'll live longer and probably be more successful. So really your task is easy if you're a tech guy. Very easy. It's simple. That one's easy. It's simple. Obey your parents. Your parents have it much worse. We'll bridge into this topic, but like I said, we'll continue it next week. Let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. Parents are to bring kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see that? And you're supposed to do it. This is what the hard part is. You're supposed to do it in a way that does not provoke them to anger. It's in chapter 6. But if you still have your fingers like this, you can look back at Colossians 3.21. Or discourage them. All right, so somehow you're supposed to bring them up in the knowledge and love of God and uh, at the same time not provoke them to anger or discourage them. Let's note the goal of parenting first. Because what often happens is that Christian parents let culture determine their goals in raising their children. So, for example, one very strong current, cultural current, in our city and in our nation is achievement or, or success. You decide that the most important thing is for your kid to excel in sports or school. And you might see church as, or Christianity as part of that, you know, teaching good values and helping him or her to be a, a good moral person. But mainly you want your kids to succeed and make a name for themselves. And so you like we said earlier, take him or her to practice instead of youth group. A game instead of church. You spend much more time talking to him or her about their homework than you do about Jesus or the Bible. Your kid gets straight A's, plays varsity ball, can tell you the batting stats for the entire Yankees bench, but has no idea that he or she is a sinner in need of salvation. No idea. So you may raise a kid who will who'll get a great job and have a great family and a great life even, but if he doesn't know Christ or she doesn't know Christ, he's going to die or she's going to die and then go to hell. Thanks, Dad. Or you'll raise a kid who thinks, this is the word, this is what I see now most often happening. You'll raise a kid who thinks that his or her self worth depends on achievement, but who falls short all the time at school or at work or whatever. And as a result, sinks into despair and drugs and self hatred or whatever. And then he or she dies and goes to hell. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm really not. I'm just, I mean, check me and see if what I'm saying is in keeping with Scripture. Your primary responsibility as a parent is what we just read just now. To preach the gospel to your kids. So if they wind up, I mean, like, if you've done that, I mean, if you've done your, if that, if you have that as your goal and you're every ounce of, of planning and energy that you 
you use in thinking about your children is geared toward bringing the gospel to them and they get it and the Lord works through your, 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 your message and this person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, but they fail in every other aspect of, the li- of their lives, who cares? You have done, you have given that child the greatest gift on, in the cosmos. Your primary goal as a parent is not to produce a college graduate. It's not to produce an honorable student, a quarterback, a hockey player, a lawyer, or a doctor. All those are fine and good things. Your goal isn't to raise a nice person, a good citizen, a really hard worker, a self-confident adult. I hope all those things are true. Those are good things, but they're not why God has honored you with the responsibility of being a parent. You have one primary purpose and goal and call. And that is to teach your children to know, love, and serve Jesus. That's it. And when you let anything else in this world, any other goal that the world might set, I just want my kid to be happy, I just want to be friends with my kid, I just want to do this, you let anything else get in the way of that primary goal, and you're, you're sinning against your child, and you're sinning against God. Now, we're going to stop here. We're going to pick up right here next week. I don't. I hate leaving on a discouraging note. So, let me say, especially for those of you who maybe have kids who've been who are kind of teenagers now, and you didn't do anything to get them into this, into you didn't preach the gospel to them when they were younger, and so church to them is like this torture, and you're just feeling like you've just really ruined it. No, I mean that we serve a God who is full of grace. Even if your kids are away and you feel like you've just squandered the opportunity. We serve a God who is full of grace and power and might. And even now you can seek him out and repent and, and pray for your children. And what he, told, what he said to Joel um, after the locusts ate all the crops and they felt like all the work they poured into um, the, the, the soil... Um, was just destroyed is that even the stuff that's messed up in the past god can take that and restore it and use it in your future so god can still take your failings and your sins and your the ways you've messed up with your kids and he can still use that in their future as well so um don't give up now even if your kids are at home keep that primary call in the forefront of your mind preach the gospel to your kids tell them about jesus Raising them up in the instruction and knowledge of the Lord. All right, we'll stop there. We'll pick up um, next week, and we'll talk about some practical hands-on things about discipline and all that kind of stuff. So uh, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, be with you. Father, thank you. Um, Thank you, Lord, that you are gracious and sovereign over all things. So first of all, Father, I confess as um, a father and a parent that I don't do what you've called me to do. And I confess on behalf of all the parents here that we don't do as you've called us to do. But Lord, you are, um, you are mighty. And I pray, Lord, that you will forgive us and you will work in our hearts um, to give us time, eagerness, a, a love for the, um, the preaching of your gospel to our children. Lord, I pray that for all those kids here who are not believers in Jesus, that you work through their Sunday school teachers and you work in their hearts and you work with their parents so that they can hear the gospel.